Okay, good morning, everybody. My name is Kate Chartres. I'm a nurse consultant in psychiatric liaison across Newcastle and Gateshead services, although I'm mostly in Newcastle. I also work for NHS England for half a day a week as a network clinical lead for the psychiatric liaison network. Um, I've been asked to present to you this morning about the impact of social isolation. Um, the presentation will last around about an hour and that'll include some time for questions at the end. You've got the, the chat function. Um, I assume to be able to add questions to um, so that I can respond to those at the end of the, the webinar. Just, just a, a quick pointer on safety. Um, I hope not, but some of the material in the webinar might be distressing for some people. Um, if you do need to take a break, take one. If you need to reach out and call a friend, do that. Um, that's just a picture of my lovely garden. So the aims of the session are to learn how our isolation can impact on all aspects of our functioning, to understand a bit more about emotional resilience and well-being, to understand uh, lived experience um, of loneliness and isolation, the difference between loneliness and being alone, um, the social, economic and cultural forces, sorry about the uh, typo there, breaking through isolation and what you can do, how the community, community might be able to help even in this current um, climate with pandemic and being on lockdown and some local services and contacts for the Northeast. So loneliness can be defined as a difference between actual social relationships and the relationships that someone desires. Um, it's being lonely rather than alone. You can be surrounded by strangers and or even friends and still feel quite lonely. It's characterized with feelings of seclusion, void and social pain. People who describe themselves as lonely feel that that is a lack of control over both the quality and the quantity of their social activity. So how does that differ in different groups, um, in emerging adults, so uh, young people who are coming of age, describe four areas that characterize loneliness for young people. Lonely and not alone, a continuous yearning for connection, so continuous experience of not feeling like they belong, feeling unimportant to others. Emerging adults also adapt to their loss um, of experience by making room for the possibility of social belonging. So, they, so they're constantly making sure that they have room for that. And there's kind of an expectation of mattering to people. In men, um, I think particularly for men, it's been exacerbated by the pand pandemic, men are realizing that they need deeper friendships. Um, white educated men have been noted in studies to have more, um, have lost more friends than in other groups. They might not want to seem needy. They've lost those kind of match day, um, post match, pint in the pub, that opportunity to kind of informally talk about what's bothering them without necessarily planning to. Married men are most likely um, than, than women to say that their spouse is their best friend as well. So what are the common causes of isolation? And I've broken these up um, based on Walker's research into different barriers that might come up. So situational barriers, illness, chronic pain, disability, financial loss, unemployment, caregiving demands, balancing those versus um, working demands, perhaps working too much due to financial hardship, having more than one job, being new to a community, having like an empty nest after your children have grown up and gone off to university, retirement, aging in terms of lost, losing loved ones, language and cultural barriers, being gifted or talented and being threatening to others perhaps, 
isolation or estrangement from someone who is um, abusive, being a family member of an addict. Internal barriers are the things that inside of us drive loneliness and isolation. Anxiety and depression, hopelessness, an avoidance of being hurt, bitterness, alienation from people, people who are extremely introverted, so struggle with socialising and communication, shame or blame about what's happened in their lives, what's going on for them, particularly for people with addictions, lack of interest in other people, cognitive or intellectual deficits, attachments to relationships that have ended. And then the forces that isolate us, chronic illness and pain again, disability, and being the primary caregiver without support, living alone, rootlessness, moving around quite a lot, rural living, or living in an unsafe area where you don't feel safe to go out. So what are the myths about isolation? You failed at relationships and therefore are alone and there's something wrong with you. Hiding your loneliness from friends and family and others is the best course of action as it's shameful and embarrassing. Actually, I think we all can feel like this. It can happen through no fault of our own. You should try to find someone that you feel you can be honest with, a safe person. It might even be a helpline or a group, a therapist, a chaplain, or other, we can become isolated through no fault of our own. As we've heard, allowing time for some self-compassion might help too. Be kind to yourself. You're alone and you're to blame for this, for your isolation. This only serves to isolate us further. You need to see beyond your own character, assassination. You might wonder if I'd planned it better, if I'd done this, if I'd picked better friends but actually isolation is caused by all kinds of things, external and forces. Going out alone is not fun and you will be judged by other people. Getting to places alone is, is okay. Think about the things that you can do, take pictures, paint, look around your local area. You could even start a blog, go out for a walk, say hi to others who are out walking. I was out for a walk recently with a um, someone that I'm working with and every time somebody passed they would say hello there's a lot of socialising I think happening at the moment particularly when the only place you can go is for a walk or for other exercise outside I can't ask for help it'll come across as too needy you need to advocate for yourself and for other people in your position you're not alone remember that asking for help um, is what you want, what you need to do is be specific about what you need, communicate by saying I've been experiencing X, it made me feel Y, and what do you want from the interaction? It might be that you contact a helpline or a support group and we'll look at things that are available in the North East later. I can only have a few good friends Support is everywhere. We can find it in our communities. We can find it um, even in lockdown. I, know, I noticed over the weekend, there's a group in, on Facebook that's all about supporting each other through COVID-19, thinking about the people who haven't got things and finding stuff for them. There was a lady who was needing a, a television, a single mum, and within a few moments, somebody had offered to give one. It's amazing how supportive and compassionate people can be to each other in extreme circumstances as we're living in now. When you have loads of friends on social media, you have someone to call. Again, that's a bit of a myth. You can have a thousand friends on social media and still have no one to call. So social media, is it useful? So I've looked at the research around this and um, passive consumption, so like downloading, is um, 
seems to pose more risks in terms of well-being, probably because it doesn't have an, any interactive element. Um, Image-based social media, so things like Instagram, tends to be um, much better because it mimics that face-to-face -face interaction. Um, so um, seems to be better for helping people and seems to be better for impacting on loneliness. I have to um, agree, I, I personally have accounts on Twitter um, Facebook and um, Instagram and whilst I'm newest to Instagram I probably prefer it because you can't upload anything without adding a photo on some kind of imagery and I think as a visual person that's really good for me. Text-based media, Twitter and texting seems to have a neutral effect um, and for young people though social media can serve to increase feelings of isolation. I would argue that that's for people across the board as well. There have been times in my life when I've been going through a difficult time where I've had to have a break from social media because people tend to just um, post using filters and I mean that both in a literal sense and in terms of, of what they're saying. It comes through a filter most people are only presenting the things that they really want the whole world to know, celebrating their achievements, etc. And that can be quite um, negative, I suppose, when you're going through a difficult time and it seems that the whole world around you is having a, a, um, a great experience. So you should avoid using social media alone to develop um, kind of engagement skills, but there, there might be some opportunities if you are going to use it as like a testing place to test out new things and to see what's out there. Don't do too much. Um, as I've said, it can be difficult in, you know, can add to your distress if everybody else seems to be having a great time. So what are the helplines that are available in the northeast and beyond? Um, so there's a crisis text service, which is um, there day and night, um, 85258. We've got crews for bereavement support, the numbers there. Um, NHS um, urgent medical advice for mental health and crisis teams can be accessed across the board via 111. Um, relate, so that's relationship advice, Samaritans, um, for a listening ear and some support. Sane line, um, similarly. Streetwise, which is specifically for Newcastle young people. Uh, women in need, I've put the national number there on um, for people who are at risk of domestic violence. And then there's a wellbeing hub that's just been launched for health and care staff. Um, so that's available 7 a.m. till 9 p.m seven days and the number is 0191-223-2030. The apps that I tend to suggest to people that they use are Calm and Headspace, though there are many, many more out there, um, things coming online all the time. Meetup.com. So this is something that I came across um, because I was reading Val Walker's book, 400 Friends and No One to Call, which is actually a um, a really nice book and has been enormously helpful in putting this presentation together. Meetup.com is an internationally um, worldwide um, forum. Uh, you can go on and put your town in or your postcode and it'll show you what's available in your area. Um, and you'd be amazed. So, so I've took, I took a photo just when I had a little look. Um, let's zoom the piano. Um, I saw... Um, uh, groups for learning to speak different languages. People are setting up all sorts of things at the moment um, because of the pandemic that are all online. So actually it makes the world smaller in many ways because you don't have to just be limited to your own area or your own postcode. So there's um, more than um, adequate things to look at in terms of what your interest might be. And actually, you know, whilst we're all working hard, um, those of us on the front line who, who are still um, working, those of us who are working from home and still trying to manage um, looking after homeschooling, etc. Actually, 
it probably is a bit more time to have a little bit of a look out there to try and have some downtime and to see what's going on. So when outside of a pandemic and when things aren't on lockdown, the meetup.com is a, is a place where you can find other people who, who might also be isolated, who are looking for people to go for walks with, people to go to the cinema with, etc. So it's a really good forum. I'm really impressed by it. Okay, so the next um, part of the presentation is based on the e-learning um, connecting with people wellbeing module. I'm a, a licensed trainer for connecting with people and I've got permission to share this as is, um, which are some elements of some of the resilience training that we deliver. So just a reminder about safety. So um, if any of the material in the presentation is distressing, please uh, take a break, call someone, um, and um, hopefully that won't be the case. Something about pandemics. So obviously we're in the midst of a pandemic. It seems to be... Um, you know, it's one um, I think Jacqueline needs to mute. Who is it that needs to mute? Thank you. Jacqueline. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so as part of the presentation, I am going to talk about my own experience of isolation and some top tips of how I got through it. Um, so that's uh, the areas that we'll be looking at in this next section, so knowing more about isolation and the importance of being connected, even during a pandemic, knowing more about resilience and well-being, uh, know how to make a well-being plan and how to access stayinsafe.net and to make a safety plan. So uh, that's me. Um, the first time I had my hair done after um, I had been unwell for quite a while. So in November 2019, I was diagnosed with uh, lobular breast cancer, um, which was a bit of a shock for my 43rd birthday. Um, it was um, also quite advanced, so I needed quite a lot of um, treatment and kind of embarked on my on the treadmill that is cancer treatment. Um, I um, and had surgery very quickly on the 17th of December. And, and at that time, the pandemic and um, the, the COVID virus seemed to be kind of going on. It was, it was starting to, it was like in the background. Um, but I, you know, I don't think any of us really thought that it would, you know, we've had other viruses that have kind of Come and we've been worried about and they've gone nowhere really. Um, the end of January um, after I'd recovered from surgery I started with chemotherapy and it wasn't till about halfway through my chemo that I was told to shield. Um, before that um, my amazing sister had come up every time for my chemos and sat with me for the whole session and then all of a sudden I was not allowed to go to any appointments with any support. Um, my partner, um, although he was allowed to work from home eventually, there was a risk that he was going to be asked and um, forced to move into a hotel because he's also a, a health worker and um, there was a view that perhaps he wouldn't be able to work from home effectively, although thankfully they did allow that so I wasn't completely alone. But actually, you know, I went from being a very busy person who has um, more than one job, who works um, lots of hours, do some private practice outside of my day job, um, have lots of friends. I would describe myself as a bit of a social butterfly. 
and all of a sudden all I've got is my uh, four walls luckily um, I have a lovely garden um, that I spent a lot of time in during this time but actually you know um, all I was getting was you know the odd phone call some face to face um, zoom calling from uh, very close family and friends but for most part people were just sending me a text intermittently and that was lovely and really nice but when something like that's going on and you're trying to add structure and trying to have a, a system in place in terms of how to manage your isolation particularly when you get energy from being with people sometimes a, a text message just don't cut it so I'll talk a bit more about how I kind of got through it. Um, suffice to say, I did my 12 weeks um, and, you know, finished my chemotherapy and cooked really well. Managed to keep my hair, as you can see, although I have hair of varying lengths uh, now because I battled with the, the cold cap and still lost about half of it. So I've got a bit of a dodgy um, mullet going on at the moment, which um, I'm embracing because that's the only thing you can do. So what are my top tips in terms of getting through it? So um, it's really important to have structure and routine. Um, so even if you're feeling really poorly and all you can do is get up and get a shower and put pyjamas back on again, then do that. Um, for me, it was really important that I had to time out my bedroom, there was only one period where I did lie in bed for about a week when things were really difficult in terms of the chemo. Um, but for the most part, I was enormously lucky and breezed through it, probably because of my positive attitude, but also because of the, the other things that I was doing in terms of um, self-hypnosis and mindfulness and, and just generally reminding myself that I, you know, the side effects are, may or may not occur and, and I was able to get through them. Um, I did limit my news consumption initially. Um, I, I spent all my time just watching what was unfolding in terms of the pandemic and I found it really not very useful. I was incredibly frustrated by, you know, the way that things were being managed and had my, you know, own opinions about that. Um, so it just wasn't useful for me. It didn't make me feel um, good. Um, I started to um, paint. Um, who knew that I could actually um, paint? I've always been a bit creative in terms of the, the colours that I put together in my house and the, um, the mad designs that I bring together and that seem to work. But I've always thought of myself as not an artistic being, as not someone who's able to do anything creative. So I... Um, still paint a little bit um, when I have time, but I really enjoy doing kind of abstract stuff. I can't do anything, you know, um, unless I've got stencils that, um, but, it, but, but I'm really, you know, impressed by the, the way that I can just dedicate my mind to it and just be in the moment and not be worrying about a future that hasn't happened yet or, uh, you know, things that have already been and gone, especially you know, when you're living with, you know, having had um, and completed treatment for breast cancer, you are forced to live with that uncertainty. You know, nobody knows who are the people that it comes back for. So being able to be in the moment and use things like um, painting. I also grew some plants from seeds. I've never done that in my life. And I'm amazed to say that I ended up with some sunflowers and um, lots of other um, things in the garden. I made sure that I cooked things from scratch and really thought about getting the right nutrients into my body, but kind of enjoyed those moments of finding, you know, time to, to do that. Um, you know, alcohol, um, whilst uh, can be helpful in the moment um, to take the edge off, it's not a long-term solution. So. I tended not to drink very much um, during that time and, and nor do I now. In fact, I'm dry at the moment for January. Um, in terms of connecting with people, um, we would do like a family quiz um, on Zoom. I had a murder mystery night with the girls for my birthday. Um, I 
when I was allowed out and, and, and I did stay in the house for 12 weeks, apart from going to get chemo and apart from going to get my chemo bloods done, um, I was in the house for 12 weeks. And it, you know, it is um, something really wrong when you're getting excited about leaving the house to go and get your bloods taken or to go and get chemo. Um, but I did see it as a bit of a treat to see the, the girls um, um, and seeing people face to face I um, think that laughter in life is really important and um, I've just found opportunities to laugh a lot. Um, I laughed through all my treatments um, whilst my sister wasn't able to come face to face for my last three chemos. I, she did join me on uh, FaceTime, um, which was really lovely. So um, we just giggled our way through it and uh, chatted about anything bubblegum really and easy things in life but if you haven't got someone to talk to you can watch something that makes you um, feel um, positive things that never hesitate but to make you laugh I love the airplane films for example and sleep um, is really important so getting enough sleep getting quality sleep trying not to have kind of having a good routine in terms of getting ready for bed at night. So not having your, your phone and not looking at screens and trying to have a, a hot bath and, you know, maybe doing some yoga. Yoga was really important to me and I did it most days because especially when, you know, I got to the point where I couldn't even go for a walk. For those 12 weeks, yoga was my salvation. It was the thing that got me through. Um, there were some times where I physically wasn't up to it but I did it most days. Um, and there's all sorts of things out there on YouTube that you can get for free that, um, that teach you, you know, really carefully um, how to do the different poses. And, and yoga is very much about the individual. You go as far as you can go um, and, and know that you just get better with practice. So that was my top tip in terms of getting through it. Um, so um, what is emotional well-being? It's when someone feels good and can reach their full potential. Um, they're able to cope with the normal stresses of life. Um, they can work productively and fruitfully. And they're age able to contribute to their family, their work or their community. Um, what is resilience? So the ability to thrive in the face of adversity, the ability to bounce back, to reach our full potential and to cope with life's challenges and come out even stronger, which I think, I feel like that's what I did when I had that very difficult period, which only ended in July when I returned to work. Um, So um, a quote here from Alice Cole King, who's the founder of the Connecting with People um, training, um, enough emotional, social, practical, health, cognitive thinking, financial, nature or spiritual resources to cope with a non-toxic amount of stress without being adversely affected. So that's what resilience is. So enough emotional, social, practical, health, cognitive, financial, nature, or spiritual resources to cope with that non-toxic amount of stress without being adversely affected. So the benefits of talking to someone you trust is so that you can feel heard and understood. You can release that built up tension, that anger, that distress. You can see a situation hopefully more clearly and look at a situation with a new or a different viewpoint. So what are the benefits of having a social support network? So um, I talked earlier about having grown sunflowers from seeds, but I, I'm going to tell you a bit of a story that's personal, but also kind of think about the sunflower as a as, an, as a, an analogy. So sunflowers need to build roots and they need 
certain conditions to grow in the same way that we as human beings need certain conditions to um, benefit. Uh, as a young plant, some flowers need some support. You, you use those sticks, don't you, to, to try and support them, not to kind of bend over. They need to be able to bend in the wind. And strength seems to come from being in a field of sunflowers. So we, as social beings, need other people to expand and to support us in terms of our social support. So when I was growing my sunflowers, I managed, I think I tried to grow about 12 and I ended up with uh, three. And I, I went and put those, those seeds that had grown into little tiny, um, the beginnings of a plant in my garden in um, a couple of places. And I um, sat back and watched, not literally, but like on a daily basis, I would go and check where they were at and use the stick to kind of support them. And they flowered really early. They flowered in about April time and that brought me lots of joy. And they, I mean, it's amazing how quickly they grow and um, thrive. And then just when the flowers had kind of started to go again, I noticed there was a fourth one that seemed to have just sprung up all of its own. It was a miniature sized one. Um, I don't know where it came from, but I, I saw it as kind of a little bit of a, a message about resilience and about um, how, how well, you know, um, sometimes we don't need all of that support. We can still thrive and survive because we've got that strength in us. Wellbeing and Coping was designed to be a supportive and helpful website, particularly in difficult times like we're experiencing at the moment. It was designed to be instantly calming and very accessible. So this first part literally just tells you a little bit about the website and it is a compassionate introduction. And I think another key thing is we emphasize the importance of self-care, but it's not a luxury, it's absolutely essential. And then the next part, we have a self-assessment scale. And again, it's very accessible, very easy to use. And people just say how they're feeling right now. And it has some tips, so okay, feeling okay, that's good, keep doing what you're doing. And it's basically ideas on how to keep it up. And then if you're coping, maybe a few more suggestions, not so good. Again, you can see we've decided to be compassionate. So we actually say, well, sorry, you're not feeling so good. And again, some specific advice. The same thing, feeling overwhelmed. And the same thing for extremely distressed. And then the next part is some more detailed using the 30-3-30 approach. And that's basically a list of things you can do in 30 seconds, three minutes, and 30 minutes. And they've all been generated by people who've either struggled with their well-being or are experts in well-being, who've had academics, people with lived experience, people who've supported others. And here, if you click there, you can download a little leaflet about well-being and the importance of looking after yourself. And this is ideal if you know somebody you're worried about. You can download it, print it and send it to them. So once you've had a look at that, I would then urge you just to go here and then make your wellbeing plan. We've got some other links. So these are some links that we know give good quality advice and support. You click down your wellbeing plan here, print it off and complete it. And it's very good to have a few emergency reboot strategies and it's basically the type of things you can use anytime, any place, anywhere. A few 30 seconds, and it's really good to have a range of activities. So some are emotional strategies, some are thinking strategies, and some may involve exercise. And again, we urge people to have one 30 minutes activity that they really enjoy find relaxing. And actually, you know, the more the better these 30 minute activities, depending on your life, lifestyle and your schedule and what you can manage. And we urge you to think about the basic things like sleep, a healthy diet, regular exercise. And it's also good to have a few 
contact names and numbers and when you can call them. That was the voice of Alice um, Cole King, the founder of Connecting with People. Well, oh, hang on. There, sorry about that. It's going to start playing again. I don't know why. Um, so thinking about the person in distress then. So um, we can get support from the third sector, the internet and social media. So the meetup.com I talked about. Um, see what's available in your area for the third sector. There's loads of things out there. The, the list is so vast that it's not something that I can just share in a presentation. Think about close friends, siblings, partner, close family, how they can support the wider family, close community. Um, like I said, there are, there are so many people out there doing such amazing things for people at the moment, making sure that their neighbours have got everything they need, for particularly people who aren't able to go out. Who are the people in your work life? Um, and then obviously, as, you know, in terms of, as things get more difficult or more distressing, then we might need to think about including the general practitioner, calling out the crisis team if it's a mental health crisis and going to the emergency department in extreme circumstances, although the preference would always be to ring the crisis team because they'll come and see you at home or they'll give you advice over the phone, depending on what's needed. So again, just um, a, a reminder about my top tips in terms of the structure, the activity, using mindfulness, limiting your news, being creative, cooking, even if you're bad at it, you may get better, um, avoiding alcohol or other mind-altering substances, connecting with other people, even if that's just by picking up the phone, um, laughing lots, um, getting enough sleep. So stayingsafe.net, um, we'll be hearing the voice of Alice again shortly. Stayingsafe.net is a website designed to help somebody make their own safety plan. So this is the landing page and it has a few supportive statements and a short film. But if you click here, it takes you onto the main part of the website. So this section is about what is the safety plan and why you need one. You can then watch Johnny Benjamin, who's a mental health activist, talking about making his own safety plan. And then here we have a detailed step-by-step -step guidance on how to make a safety plan for somebody maybe who's finding the website for the first time. We then have support for someone who is maybe worried about someone else or, or supporting and guiding somebody. We then have sources of an emergency help which are available 24-7. And then we have a specific section here designed specifically for young people. Here we have some films of people who have made their own safety plan and they talk about how helpful it is. And in this section, you can actually download an empty safety plan, which some people prefer to do if it's some people would actually rather make one on paper, but actually others would rather make one electronically and it's ideal if you do this because especially if you have it on your phone it, it's with you all the time so it's there whenever you need it so the first part is getting through right now you can see i've got a few things here which i've added on so if you click on the suggestions and you click on that then it pre it populates your plan for you and all these suggestions are from people who've had a tough experience, had tough times, and they've got through. They've tried and tested, they're not patronizing, but we also know they're safe because they've been checked by experts. So then it's a good idea to maybe have things that are special, that mean something to you. So it could be a photo of a special person or pet, or maybe a special place. Then the next one is maybe some helpful strategies. But if you have a look, there's lots of ideas. And all these are full of good ideas. Then you can think of ways to make your situation safer. So if you click on there, there's lots of ideas, including maybe removing things that you might use to harm yourself. Then it's good to have a few 
ideas of what you can do to lift or calm the mood. So for example, it might be to phone somebody, to do some breathing exercises. So all these headings have got lots of ideas. Again, they're all tried and tested. And when you click on it, it pops up there. So have a look at these. Some of them are creative, some of them are concentration. Then it's things to distract you. Now, with the people to support you, when they add the contact, you put their name, their phone number, but also their contact hours. So if they say that they can, you can ring them till say midnight, write that down so that then you don't doubt yourself. Or some people may say you can ring them day or night. So write it down and then you can save it. Then you have specific organizations that you know or people, if you were very distressed, that you know you can reach out to. And then some emergency professional support. And again, the contact comes up again. So you can write the name, their opening hours, and any notes. And then you can save it, or you can download it. You can email it to yourself, or email it to somebody that's supporting you. Take care, everyone. So suicide um, is not an inevitable outcome of suicidal thoughts. So people um, who, if they get to the stage where they are having suicidal thoughts, um, reach out, speak to someone. You don't have to be an expert to make a difference. So anybody can be supportive and help you to think about that. Letting people know just about stayingsafe.net, knowing that it's never too early to make a safety plan. I've got one. Who knows when um, the, with the perfect storm of things that can happen in life that I might end up in that place. Safety plans are the mental health equivalent of car seat belts. We need to have them to hopefully make sure that we don't need to use them, if that makes sense. Stayingsafe.net can help you to make one. So hopefully, um, this webinar has allowed you to know a bit more about me and my story, how I got through isolation, to know a bit more about isolation and the importance of staying connected even through these difficult times, knowing more about resilience and building your well-being. Make, you know, if you don't do anything else, go and make a well-being plan, go and make a safety plan. It's all there for you. Even if you just do it in your head and think about what you would do to change things and to give yourself that time to self-soothe. We all need that time to look after ourselves. Otherwise, we won't be able to look after everybody else. Okay, there's just some references there. And... Um, an opportunity for any questions. I don't know if there is a chat function or if anybody has any. Uh, sorry, I'm just. Okay. Um, I'm looking in the chat. Will it be possible to have the presentation slides? Um, it will be difficult to, I'll be able to share them as a PDF. Um, sorry, there is a question there. Any advice on how people can connect if they don't have access online or a phone? So as I kind of mentioned, you know, um, getting out and about. Um, I know that we're not allowed to go too far, but even going for a walk and um, seeing what's out there, there are some social um, and uh, other um, groups. So there's something called Peer Talk that runs groups. There's one in Sunderland, there's one in Whitby Bay, there's one in um, Gateshead, um, Peer Talk. So their um, uh, support groups are still allowed to meet at the moment. Um, if they're less than 15 people, which they generally are, um, you can find them online. They'll, there are other things like that. Um, and we can put them, um, have a look what, what there is. Um, you'll be able to, if you don't have access to online, I don't know how you would find them. 
um, I will forward the information about Peer Talk. And the wellbeing and coping.net website is not NHS, no, it's provided by For Mental Health, which is the connecting with people people. Um, for elderly people in terms of shielding and experiencing isolation. Um, obviously, the you know, um, that's the information that I've given about structure and routine. So, you know, even if there were days when I was on my own and I had no contact with any other human beings um, online, you know, there, there are still things that you can do in terms of making sure that you have a system. So not finding you know, that you're spending all of your time just watching television, having time to read, listening to a nice piece of music, making sure that you kind of go into a different part of the house for your meals so that you kind of have that interest and in different things that are going on. The recording will be available on Recovery Online um, and um, 